Asakawa turned on the VCR and pushed the tape into the slot. He sat down cross-legged right in front of the screen and pressed play. He heard the capstan start to turn. He had high hopes that the key to unlock the riddle of four people's deaths was hidden on this tape. He pushed play, fully intending to be satisfied with just a clue, any clue. There can't be any danger, he was thinking. What harm could come from just watching a videotape? Random sounds and distorted images flickered on the screen, but once he had selected the right channel, the picture steadied. Then the screen went black as ink. This was the video's first scene. There was no sound. Wondering if it had broken, he brought his face close to the screen. Consider yourself warned. You'd better not see it, you'll be sorry you did. Shuichi Iwata's words came back to him. Why should he be sorry? Asakawa was used to things like this. He'd covered the local news. 
No matter what sort of horrific images he might be shown, he felt confident he wouldn't regret watching. In the middle of the black screen, he thought he saw a pinpoint of light begin to flicker. It gradually expanded, jumping around to the left and right, before finally coming to rest on the left-hand side. Then it branched out, becoming a frayed bundle of lights, crawling around like worms, which finally formed themselves into words. Not the kind of captions one normally saw on film, though. These were poorly written, as if scrawled by a white brush on jet black paper. Somehow, though, he managed to make out what they said. Watch until the end, a command. These words disappeared, and the next floated up into view. You will be eaten by the lost. The last word didn't make much sense, but being eaten didn't sound too pleasant. It seemed that there must have been and or else implied there. Don't turn off the video halfway through, or else something awful will happen. It was a threat. You will be eaten by the lost. The words grew larger and chased all the black from the screen. It was a flat change, from black to milk white. It was a patchy, unnatural colour, and began to resemble a series of concepts painted on a canvas one over another. The unconscious, squirming, worrying, finding an exit, spurting out, or maybe it was the throb of life. Though it had energy, bestially satiating itself on darkness. Strangely, he felt no desire to push stop. Not because he was unafraid of whatever wanted to eat him, but because the intense outpouring of energy felt good. Something red burst onto the monochrome screen. At the same time, he heard the ground rumble from an indefinable direction. The sound seemed to come from everywhere, such that he began to imagine that the whole cabin was shaking. It didn't feel like the sound was coming from those little speakers. The sluggish red fluid exploded and flew about, sometimes occupying the whole screen, from black to white and now red. It was nothing but a violent secession of colours. He hadn't seen any natural scenery yet, just concepts in the abstract, etched vividly into his brain by the brilliantly shifting colours. It was tiring, actually. And then, as if it had read the viewer's mind, the red retreated from the screen, and a mountain vista stretched out. At one glance, he could tell it was a volcano with a gentle peak. The volcano was sending up white puffs of smoke against a clear blue sky. The camera seemed to be situated somewhere at the foot of the mountain, where the ground was covered with rugged blackish brown lava. Again, the screen was swathed in darkness. The clear blue sky was instantaneously painted black, and then, a few seconds later, a scarlet liquid spurted from the center of the screen flowing downward. A second explosion. The spray thrown up by it burned red, and as a result he could begin to make out, faintly, the outline of the mountain. The images were now concrete where they had previously been abstract. This was clearly a volcanic eruption, a natural phenomenon, a scene that could be explained. The molten lava flowing from the mouth of the volcano, threaded its way down through ravines and headed this way. Where was the camera positioned? Unless it was an aerial shot, it looked like the camera was about to be swallowed up. The rumblings of the earth increased until the whole screen seemed about to be engulfed in molten rock. And then the scene abruptly changed. There was no continuity from one scene to the next, only sudden shifts. Thick black letters floated into view against a white background. Their edges were blurred, but he somehow managed to make out the character for Mountain. It was surrounded by black splatters, as if it had been written sloppily by a brush dripping with ink. The character was motionless, the screen was calm. Another sh sudden shift, a pair of dice. Tumbling around 
in the rounded bottom of a lead bowl. The background was white, the bottom of the bowl was black, and the one on the dice was red. These same three colours he'd seen so often already. The dice rolled around soundlessly, finally coming to rest. A one and a five. The single red dot and the five black ones arranged on the white faces of the dice. What did it mean? In the next scene, people appeared for the first time. An old woman, faced lined with wrinkles, sat perched on a pair of of tatami mats on a wooden floor. Her hands rested on her knees, and her left shoulder was thrust slightly forward. She was speaking, slowly, looking straight ahead. Her eyes were different sizes. When she blinked, it looked like she was winking instead. She was speaking in an unfamiliar dialect, and he could only catch every other word or so. Your health, since, spend all your time, bound to get you, understand, be careful of, you're going to, you listen to granny now because, there's no need to. The old expressionless woman made her statement, then vanished. There were a lot of words that he didn't understand but he had the impression he had just been lectured to. She was telling him to be careful of something, warning him. Who was this old lady talking to, and about? The face of a newborn baby filled the screen. From somewhere, he could hear a baby's first cry. This time, too, he wasn't sure it didn't come from the television speakers. It came from very near, beneath his face. It was very like a real voice. On screen, he could now see hands holding the baby. The left hand was under its head, and the right was behind its back, holding it carefully. They were beautiful hands. Totally absorbed by the image, Asakawa found himself holding his own hands in the same position. He heard the birth cry directly below his own chin. Startled, he pulled back his hands. He had felt something, something warm and wet, like amniotic fluid, or blood in the weight of flesh. Asakawa jerked his hands apart, as if casting something aside, and brought his palms close to his face. A smell lingered. The faint smell of blood. Had it come from the womb, or...? His hands felt wet, but in reality, they weren't even damp. He restored his gaze to the screen. It still showed the baby's face. In spite of the crying, its face was swathed in a peaceful expression, and the shaking of its body had spread to its groin, even wiggling its little thing. The next scene. A hundred human faces. Each one displayed hatred and animosity. He couldn't see any distinguishing features other than that. The myriad faces, looking as if they had been painted on a flat surface, gradually receding into the depths of the screen. And as each face diminished in size, the total number increased, until they had swollen to a great mag multitude. It was a strange multitude, though, existing only from the neck up, but the sounds welling up from them befit a crowd. Their mouths were shouting something. Even as they shrank and multiplied, he couldn't quite make out what they were saying. It sounded like the commotion of a great gathering, but the voices were tinged with criticism, abuse. The voices were clearly not welcoming or cheering. Finally, he made out a word, liar, and another, fraud. By now, there were perhaps a thousand faces. They had become nothing but black particles, filling the screen until it looked like the television had been turned off. But the voices continued. It was more than Asakawa could bear. All that criticism directed right at him, 
that's how it felt. When the next scene appeared, it showed a television on a wooden stand. It was an old-fashioned 19-inch set with a round channel selector, and a rabbit ear antenna sat on its wooden cabinet. Not a play within a play, but a TV within a TV. The television within had nothing on its screen yet, but it seemed to be on. The red light by the channel knob was lit, and the screen within the screen wavered, stabilized, and then wavered again, over and over with increasing frequency. Then a single character appeared hazily, Sada. The word faded in and out of focus, distorted, and began to look like another before disappearing altogether, like chalk on a blackboard wiped with a wet rag. As he watched, Asakawa began to find it hard to breathe. He could hear his heartbeat, feel the pressure of the blood flowing in his veins. A smell, a touch, a sour sweet taste stabbing his tongue. Strange. Something was stimulating his five senses, some medium besides the sounds and visions that appeared, as if he were suddenly recalling them. Then the face of a man appeared. Unlike the previous images, this man was definitely alive, he had a pulsating vitality. As he watched, Asakawa began to feel hatred towards him. He had no idea why he should hate this man. He wasn't particularly ugly, his forehead sloped a bit, but other than that, he was actually rather well formed. But there was something dangerous in his eyes. There were the eyes of a beast closing in on its prey. The man's face was sweaty, his breathing was ragged, his gaze was turned upward, and his body was moving rhythmically. Behind the man grew scattered trees, the afternoon sunlight shone between their branches. The man brought his eyes down and looked straight ahead again and his gaze locked with the viewers. Asakawa and the man stared at each other for a while. The stifling, stifling sensation grew, and he suddenly wanted to tear his gaze away. The man was drooling, his eyes were bloodshot, his neck muscles began to fill the screen in a close-up, then disappeared on, off the left side of the screen. For a while, only the black shade of the trees could be seen. A scream began to well up from deep down inside. At the same time, the man's shoulder came back into view, then his neck, and finally his face again. His shoulders were bare, and the right one carried a deep, bloody gash several centimeters long. Drops of blood seemed to be sucked toward the camera growing larger and larger until they hit the lens and clouded over the view. The screen cut the black once, twice, almost like blinking, and when the light returned, everything was red. There was a murderous look in the man's eyes. His face drew closer, along with his shoulder, the bone peeking out white, where the flesh had been gouged out. Asakawa felt a violent pressure on his chest. He saw trees again. The sky was spinning. The color of the sky fading into sunset. The rustling of dry grass. He saw dirt, then weeds, and then sky again. Somewhere he heard a baby crying. He wasn't sure if it was the little infant from before. Finally, the edge of the screen turned black. Darkness gradually encroaching in a ring on the center. Dark and light were clearly defined now. At the center of the screen, a small round moon of light floated in the middle of the darkness. There was a man's face in the moon. A fist-sized clump of something fell from the moon, making a dull thud. Another, and then another. With each sound, the image jumped and swayed. The sound of flesh being smashed and then true darkness. Even then, a pulse remained. Blood still circulated, throbbing. This scene went on and on, a darkness that seemed as if it would never end. Then, just as at the beginning, 
words faded into view. The writing in the first scene, like that of a child just learning to write, but this was somewhat better. White letters, drifting into view, and then fading, red. Those who have viewed these images are fated to die at the exact hour one week from now. If you do not wish to die, you must follow these instructions exactly. Asakawa gulped and stared wide-eyed at the television, but then the scene changed yet again. A complete and utter change. A commercial came on. A perfectly ordinary, common television commercial. A romantic old neighbourhood on a summer's evening. An actress in a light cotton robe sitting on her veranda. Fireworks lighting up the night sky. A commercial for mosquito repelling coils. After about 30 seconds, the commercial ended. And just as another scene was about to start, the screen returned to its previous state. Darkness. With a last overglow of faded words, then the sound of static as the tape ended.